Wow. Well, this one came up in my feed as well. And the thing is that, I, I mean, I know that he wants to weigh in on big political news and stuff, but um, Sam Teeter, dude, you keep showing us over and over again that you are totally unaware of what's happening in California. Like, I, at first I thought it was just L.A. Nope. You have no idea what's happening in California. <laughs> oh, my God, even. All right. This is uh, exciting, for, and particularly for those in California. We do not know for sure whether Dianne Feinstein is going to retire in 2024, because after all, she'll only be, what, like 106? Do we know how old she'll be? Does she know? In 2024? Yeah. She's 89 now. I mean, you know, that's the thing, too. If you get a big piece of news like this, don't you want to, like, have, like, a fact sheet in front of you so you have some of the basic details? Um, I don't know. I mean, it has appeared like you're scripted before, especially when you um, mixed up taxidermy with taxology. Um, but oftentimes it looks like if that's the case, they're trying to script you to look ignorant. Like you really don't know what's going on, right? If that's the case. I don't know if you're reading off a teleprompter. She'll be 91. 91. Now, look, um... I, you know, I have had a, a great uncle who lived to 104. My grandmother lived to 101. Uh, my father's getting up there. My mother's getting up there. And um, there is no doubt in my mind that, uh, and, and my uncle, my great uncle, he went into work until his uh, mid-90s as a lawyer. Now, he wasn't taking a full caseload. Um, but, you know, and he'd show up. He'd have a desk. He had a couple of clients. Diane Feinstein uh, reportedly has no idea where she is half the time. Th that's not me talking. I obviously have no contact with her whatsoever. I've never had contact with her. Well, part of the requirement of serving in Congress um, or Senate or as president, I think the president has to do this, but probably none of the other higher, higher offices um, should be a, a part of the physical examination should be a mental um, examination as well you know are you um, not make sure that you're not suffering from from uh, degenerative elderly situations like Alzheimer's or dementia right um, or there should be a requirement within the bylaws that if there is some consistent behavior observed by colleagues I mean, that could be used for a smear campaign, but I mean, like, just like set up a, a thing where you require that they get past, you know, past that same physical examination to show their, you know, mental aptitude. But yeah, um, it, watching this segment, it looks like it's only 10 minutes long, so that's good. Um, watching this segment just kind of shows further that, like, Sam doesn't know who the potential competitors are going to be in this race. He uh, doesn't really know much about the districts that, that Katie was representing in the first place. It's, um, it, it's almost like he's kind of briefly looking at some of the other live streamers who covered it, like David Dole. And getting just a few talking points, but not enough. Like, not actually doing the homework and really understanding what's happening. But rather just, ugh, dude, it's like phoning it in every time I watch this this dude. Um, and so it's time for her to go about two years ago. Maybe four years ago, frankly. But it's clear that she's going to serve out her term for whatever reason. Um, and maybe she'll run again. Which is why I, I, I like this announcement and the way that it was framed. Katie Porter has announced that she's going to be running for this seat with the presumption that it's going to be vacated by Dianne Feinstein, which is hopefully going to be helpful in those people around Dianne Feinstein getting her out of that seat. But uh, here's Katie Porter's announcement. I 
couldn't hope for a better senator um, than I think Katie Porter would uh, be. I think it's pretty obvious that, like, um, Katie would have had to go up and down the, ste the uh, state trying to figure out who her allies are within the party, um, who will sway their delegates in her direction for the endorsement. And that's how you put pressure on incumbents or whatnot. Because the, her first step is going to have to be getting 20% of the delegates within the state, an entire 20% within the state, to pull the uh, pre the, the 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 incumbents have like a slide through endorsement. They don't have to be considered at the pre endorsement conference. And so once they go to the endorsement conference, it's pretty much just a mandate that they've got it. Like they're they're in, right? They there are a lot of um, protections in the bylaws of the California Democratic State Party that will protect her incumbency. But in as I've said on other videos. In 2018, the party delegates voted to pull that pre-endorsement, and it went up to a floor vote, at which point she was not able to reach the 60% threshold to actually gain that endorsement. So the party has for a long time now been identifying that she needs to go. And these recent questions about her mental agility are even more recent, that she needs to go. And Katie would make... Uh, great sense for our state. He's right. We should be the progressive example and we're not. We're, we're the example of corporate dem democratic ship and so is New York, quite frankly. Like, we've made some headway with various wins but um, the establishment I hate using that word because pretty much anybody who's been in um, doing any positions within the party for a while now are also considered part of the establishment. But basically, the third way Democrats, the Democrats that believe in centricism, that they have to make all sorts of concessions to um, the Republicans in order to get um, bills passed, even when they have a, a majority, which is kind of crazy, right? But anyway, let's see what he's got here. I mean, it's probably going to be another... Um, showing of Katie's announcement, which already David did too. I feel like he, this guy's like stealing talking points from David Dole. We're living through a time of extraordinary change. I'm Katie Porter. Change can be electrifying and exhilarating, but change can also be disruptive, like the constant assault on our democracy and the dangerous imbalance in our economy. The threat from so-called leaders like Mitch McConnell has too often made the United States Senate the place where rights get revoked, special interests get rewarded, and our democracy gets rigged. Especially in times like these, California needs a warrior in Washington. And that's exactly why I'm announcing my candidacy for the United States Senate in 2024. I don't do Congress the way others often do. I use whatever power I have to speak hard truths to the powers that be. To not just challenge the status quo, but call it out, name names, and demand justice. That goes for taking on Wall Street and the big banks, big oil, and big pharma. It's why I refuse to accept corporate PAC and lobbyist campaign money. I don't want it. And I'm leading the fight to ban congressional stock trading because it's just wrong. To win these fights, it's time for new leadership in the U.S. Senate. If you agree, please go to katieporter.com. Yeah, I mean, is there more to that or no? That's it. No, that's good. Um, so this is great news. And um, by announcing this early, she hopefully will scare people out. I imagine if she gets a lot of uh, donations, if they have an announcement over the next day, 24, 48 hours, that X number of dollars have come in, that's going to scare people out of the race. I mean, that's what this is meant to do. It is meant to show that she's got the strength, that she's going to be very tough to beat, trying to make herself the presumptive, um, you know, heir, if you will, to that seat, all of which um, I would have a lot of problems with if I didn't like Katie Porter. But I do. And that's what politics is. Mm -hmm. Right. Like um, and um, so and certainly anybody entering the race to her right should not be welcome. Exactly. And and and, and, and frankly, like, I just don't know that you're going to find anybody to her left that is going to have the opportunity to win across that state. 
She has proven that she can win. He's directing that at Ro Khanna. But um, I agree with him. I, I don't think Ro Khanna is technically to her left anyway. Because he certainly doesn't act that way when he's actually in Congress. Um, but also, here's a little fun fact. At uh, the uh, Democratic Party of Orange County meeting that we had in 2018, November 2018, after the election... Um, I had, I, I had like a bet. It wasn't a money bet. It was just like a bet for pride. Um, with one of my, I'm, I was not a delegate to central committee, but she was an alternate, I think at the time. And I was not an alternate yet. That happened a year later, but I had a bet with her and, um, the chair of the Canyon Dems club, um, pulled up the, the, the data to verify which one of us won the bet. And the bet was that um, she believed Harley Ruda had to go closer to the center because there were more Republicans in the coastal district. And I said, I disagree with you. I'm quite certain that Katie, this is before redistricting, when she was, she had just won the 45th by the skin of her teeth and it took uh, at least a couple weeks for the final vote count. But she just squeaked it out over Mimi Walters. Um, I said, no, there's more Republicans in that district. And because it, it went all the way over to Anaheim Hills, where there's a lot of rich equine property. I said, um, not only did she you know, win, but she, she won with a larger margin and cause he, his was even tighter and she won on a populist platform on Medicare for all, whereas he ditched it. He got the PDA endorsement in the primary for his district by telling us all that he was going to support Medicare for all. And then as soon as the primary ended, he asked PDA to remove the endorsement and his survey saying that he supported Medicare for all so that he could move to the center. In in a, a, a district that was when she started, you know, uh, running, well, it was reddish, actually. And now I would say probably more arguably purple, uh, like and, all of and, California. And but. this and her race, even this past cycle was very close and she and she fought it out. So she yeah. was, she's unseated. She unseated a, a Republican to win her. And she, he doesn't know what the hell's going on. Her old district, the one that was the majority of territory that she had, um, and it thumbnailed out to where she lives in Irvine. But through redistricting, they cut Irvine in half, and now she's on the coast where Harley was ran, running. So the majority of her district now is Michelle Steele's and Harley Ruda's former district. So to say that... Um, her former district because he's he's making it out like these are not the same things like she, she took over a lot of different territory in his district was more purple than hers right it wasn't red because we had laguna beach that's like a blue city aliso viejo is progressive it's a completely purple mixed city costa mesa is blue Huntington Beach is red. Um, Newport Beach is red. But Huntington Beach is more purple now because for a while there we had a Democratic city council. But but the, it's also a place of demonstration. And so that's why they always make the news because the, the MAGA people descend on um, the main pier. But uh, this is, once again, like you're trying to simplify things because you don't know... Like, what really happened? Like, she's running in pretty much a completely different district than where she served two terms before this. Different scenarios. Her district that she won in in 2018 was more red than Harley's. And she won on a populist platform. See, and then has held it, so I think it's a... Yeah, and, 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 and frankly, like, in terms of just being... 
a proven commodity in the way that she approaches being a lawmaker and in terms of providing oversight. Um, it's not inconceivable you could do better, but I would want more evidence than uh, somebody who is, I don't know, I'm just speaking of conjecture, you know, sat on a city council or was a county supervisor or something like that. Um, and frankly, this is what we should have in New York, too. We should have two senators like Katie Porter from from California, and we should have two like this from New York, where when you're in a blue state and a Democrat is going to win this Senate seat, they should be as far to the left as possibly sustainable by the state. Bottom line, we need we need blue states to send the most progressive Democrats possible to the Senate and to the House. We just need that for the sake of of of, of the country, but also in terms of progressive politics. It would be maximizing the the model of like not just the squad, but just like for example, people like you know like Chewy Garcia in Illinois, like people who have like. Deep, deep, some of the most blue districts in the country being also the most far to the left members of Congress there are. Yeah. And I mean, and that's why, you know, you would see like the. Well, and that's exactly why Ro Khanna should not run, because um, everything that he touches is like, like the 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 progressive slate that he endorsed for the CDP progressive caucus. Um rolls in the same way it's like that it's always spoiler candidates with no real path to winning and um and a bunch of smear campaigns come out with every one of these things <sighs> i'm not looking forward to this um i'll probably like i'm i'm injured so there's not much i can do but i'll probably reach out to katie and see if i can postcard uh, like for an hour a day or something, just something stupid that I can help with. But there's really not much I can do until I heal. Justice Democrats had their strategy was to win in primaries. Right. That where they're not, there's no chance of them being a spoiler. And the amount of money that you need for a primary is much less than it would be a general election. And where, you know, winning the primary is essentially winning the general election. That's been the strategy. Much harder to do on a Senate level, right. but uh, still very important. And and we're getting there. You know, we're, we're you know we're getting there. It's uh it, it's it's slow, but um, the Senate is. Maybe we need to. Is Barbara Boxer still alive? Maybe we need to have her reach out to Diane, and have a conversation with her. Is, you know, becoming is moving to the left. I mean, it just simply is as a as a as a fact. Um, you know, it's taken 20, 20 years, but it's happening. Hello. He hung up by mistake. I'll take one more. Nine seven three. You just got a bonus. Nine seven three. Nine seven three. Is this me? Yeah, it's you. Nine seven three. Shout out to the Twitch chat. Can you hear me? Yep. Shout out to the Twitch chat. What's on your mind? Shout out to the Discord chat. To coolest chat. Okay. I wanted to ask you, what's your honest opinion on who might win if Adam Schiff jumps in against Katie Porter? Because I feel like he has a lot of newer impeachment. All right. Hold up. So this is one of the more disappointing parts of of this particular clip is that um sam cedar is learning for the first time that adam schiff has already been throwing his name out there he hasn't officially announced but he was leaking stuff to the press as much as uh, like a month ago at least i want to say that that he is considering running for it and so we've all got, been getting a little tense about him actually getting in the race and I, that's why i'm saying like if you're going to do a story, don't you think you should get some basic talking points and like know who all is being considered? Like that Ro Khanna, I obviously you already know about Ro Khanna. You haven't said his name, but you know that he's out there. 
talking about it, and hopefully they're going to talk him down, too. Um, it's Rokana, Adam Schiff, Barbara Lee. Um, I mean, as a political wizard, as a political commentator, don't you think that you should have a little bit more research handy before you go live with a story like this? Gusto, and that could be dangerous to Katie, but after all that gusto, he's just a milk toast Democrat against the mighty Katie Porter. You know, to be honest with you, it hadn't even occurred to me, but I, I don't know. I mean, God, God help us. Adam Schiff is just... Yeah, I mean, come on. He's going to take oil money. He's going to take pharmaceutical money. He's going to take Wall Street money. All of the things that Katie has sworn she will not take, right? That's a huge source of income, and that's why we have corporate Democrats leading the, the way in Congress. Um, I mean, come on, man. I, I think completely useless as a senator. So I think he's already, <clears throat> he's already planting... Um, it was a little disrespectful for her to, uh, you know, announce pre Feinstein. Boo hoo! Yeah, you know, Good right. for her. Yeah. Well, you know, um, he's probably hooking up with Harley Ruda because Harley Ruda did the same thing when she announced she was running for Congress on the Ghost. Yeah. Good for her. Good for her. Yeah. I mean, look, I. It's hard for me to see that he would have motivated supporters. Like I, like Katie Except Porter. Except he does that. I think they'd be problematic ideologically. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, I agree. But but that ideology tends not to necessarily to be like Katie Porter seems to me the type of like pop person who would inspire people from like I'm going from Ohio to work on Katie yeah. Porter's uh, campaign. I, I just it's hard for me to imagine that there are uh, wh what's your name uh, caller. Matt from New Jersey. Matt, it's hard for me to imagine people doing that for Schiff. Now, with that said, that's that could be just my own, like you know, bias. And yeah. uh, but uh, I got to think that Katie Porter's. That's not how corporate Democrats win. They win through buying the most TV ads. They win by buying the billboards. They win by buying the most mailers. And that's why the fundraising is so important. And that's why I received I probably a half dozen emails from Katie Porter's campaign today. Because they, they want to have a, a great first day donations um, posting. Kind of like Bernie, right? They want to be able to show that they, they took in a ton of donations on day one. Because that is a sign of viability in a candidate. To be able to get a lot more smaller donations, but... Schiff is going to be able to get a lot more bigger donations. Um, you know, I like to think that maybe the fact that Diane Feinstein was a woman, that maybe there's a sense in California she should be replaced with a woman. I, you know, I'm, I'm reaching for straws here. But um, good for Katie Porter. Well, that right there would make Barbara Lee viable as well. Right? So if, if she is also considering putting her name in the hat, then she could potentially, and she's more progressive than Adam Schiff, but she's not as progressive as Katie Porter. But she could potentially, because I don't think she has sworn off corporate money, take some of the same sources as Adam Schiff to get, to take away some of his funding and um, do the same sort of strategy of, I don't need to be everywhere, but it could probably, she'd probably do a hybrid strategy is my thoughts. This is why yeah. she's so good, because she goes right for the jugular. I'm going to announce and make Adam Schiff go, look, it was rude for him to do that. Shut up. Appreciate the call, man. All right, thanks. Left his best. Thank you. Good last call of the day. All right. 